Good evening and welcome to the theater tonight for our event with Rue Freeman. My name is John Freeman and I am not her brother, although after tonight you'll understand why I wish that were true. I want to say a huge thank you to the Lannan family and the Lannan Foundation for bringing me here to be the interlocutor for tonight's event with Rue Freeman and to also have the chance to introduce her to you uh, if her work is new. I also want to thank Martha from the Lannan Foundation events for putting this event together. For all, <laughs> thank you, Martha. For all of the best writers, style is a struggle. Style is a struggle to be because a writer is someone who needs to write to exist. They need to tell stories to exist. To fully be themselves, they have to be another. They have to try on another self. They have to throw their voice. But style is also a struggle to draw their view of the world into a form, into a poem, into an essay, into a novel. Think of all the great novels and try to think of one that didn't have an idea behind it of how the world worked, where it could do better, where it might be more just. There are a few writers at work today who have drawn these two forms of struggle together with the greater human struggle for justice and for dignity than Rue Freeman. Whether it is in her short stories or poems, in the anthologies she has edited, or her two brilliant novels, Rue Freeman tells stories that implicate the reader in moral judgments, that makes us watchers of watchers, of onlookers, and then reminds us that there is particip participation in that vantage point. She is also a quantum physicist of the novel. I say that because she works with elements that are constantly changing size and shape and weight and speed, the fractals of home and family, of language and desire, of the ever-shifting stamp of class and power throughout societies. In most of her work, that society is the home of Sri Lanka, where she was born in 1967 and raised the child of a teacher and a civil servant, both of them lovers of literature. Rue went to university in Sri Lanka and Australia and then on to Bates College in the United States. In her first novel, A Disobedient Girl, published in 2009, a young orphan is attached to an aristocratic family and raised the servant of a spoiled girl whose fate, she become, whose fate she shadows like an echo as their lives become more and more intertwined and dependent. In 2013, she published On Sal Mall Lane, a gorgeous novel that conjures life on an otherwise quiet block of cricket matches, just as forces within Sri Lankan society lean heavily into each other and build towards that country's terrible civil war. History does not happen to her characters. It is made by her characters in the ways they challenge one another, betray one another, make love to one another. They are not microcosms of society. They are it. To believe in this type of storytelling is an act of faith. It demonstrates a belief that the untold stories of na nations lurk in the lives of everyday people. For this reason, and due to the power of her narratives, which sweep forward with the confidence of the heyday of the 19th century novel, one sees in Rue Freeman's work a return to the enlarging novel, not the one that reduces, but one that opens up and makes us see. She must believe in the power of narrative to overcome other ways of seeing, as her most recent project was an assemblage of stories about Palestine, a book with contributions from Colin McCann, Ricky Lorenzis, and many other leading writers dealing with what they saw upon visiting those contested territories. So for the next 45 minutes, you will have this light shown directly at you. I suspect it will light up this auditorium and make the falling light outside seem very dark indeed. I hope you collect this light somewhere inside you and take it home in the form of a book and watch as it illuminates the rooms of your life and shows you things you did not know had always existed there. Ladies and gentlemen, Rue Freeman. Good evening, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you, John, for that introduction. 
Someone pointed out that John and I have a, a share a tendency to rush out and embrace projects that we may not feel completely capacitated to take on, but feel like something good will come out of it, so we go and do it anyway. Um, so I'm looking forward to talking to him later, and uh, it's, a, it's an honor to share the stage with him. Um, I'm going to start by reading an essay that I had to write to a prompt. It was a reading series where they gave you a prompt, you wrote, wrote something, and then you presented it. And um, the essay progresses with me trying to find my way back to what was, the, the prompt was called a rough day, a rough day in my life. I couldn't for the life of me imagine what a rough day might have looked like in my life. And as a further preface to that, I will say that I grew up in a family where we were not encouraged to think of ourselves as being particularly deprived or uh, uniquely oppressed, despite the fact that we certainly had scarcity in our lives and our life was sometimes difficult, often desperate. Uh, we had options, whether real or imagined. Uh, our life necessitated an audacious imagination. We had parents who read and wrote, and that in itself was a wealth. And so, uh, you know, if one of us was imprisoned, as my brother was, if we had the capacity in terms of language or social capital or, uh, you know, the skills of reaching out to people, uh, then we couldn't call ourselves oppressed. Uh, if we had no shoes, but we had someone we could borrow it from, if we had no food, but we could still get up and get dressed and go to school, then to claim to be oppressed or, um, or deprived was to confess to a certain impoverishment of moral caliber in my family. Uh, so, in addition to that, I grew up in a, a predominantly Buddhist culture, who's, one of whose important tenets is the presence of suffering, and uh, that it's, not some, it's something to be withstood, not complained about. And I was educated by the Roman Catholic nuns. So, it was a triumvirate of forces that made it very difficult for me to uh, think of myself as having anything that could compare. But, so I'm going to read this, uh, this essay, and it's, I, I chose it because it gives you the clearest uh, idea of who I am and how I move through this world and what moves me as a writer. Um, and if there are funny parts, feel free to laugh, it's okay. <laughs> it's also dark. Uh, it's called Memory Loss. I don't know which year it was exactly. It couldn't have been 1971, when my paternal uncle was bodyguard to the world's first female prime minister, Mrs. Sirimavo Bandaranaike, who rose to prominence and would forever be known as the mother, after her husband was assassinated, and this is true, by none other than a rabid Buddhist monk, and who presided over the mass murder of thousands of young men and the rise in stature of the country in the World Bank reports, which hailed Sri Lanka as the new Singapore. It couldn't have been 1983 when the cities burned and neighbors were butchered and refugees filled our homes and we children pretended to play in the gardens outside so nobody would think to come looking for the people with the wrong names rendered speechless in our houses clutching passports and identity cards and their bits and pieces of gold jewelry. It couldn't have been 1986, when the death threats flew into our home from every available orifice like a determined summons to Hogwarts at 4 Privet Drive, except that we lived at 601 upon 2 Havelock Road, Columbus 6, and there was nothing magical about life in those times, except that people disappeared and 18-year-old boys were found arranged in rings like the circle of the Buddhist Dharma Chakra, their limbs decapitated, beheaded, or with tires around their necks, charred streaks of black on the pavement like chalk, the shaded avenues of the universities, on streets, by the riverbanks. It could have been 1987, when our house filled up with boys. My brothers, yes, but nine of their friends, all occupying my brother's room while I slept alone, alas, I thought, in my bedroom. Among them, my boyfriend, in my preferred ilk, a girly boy, sweet-faced, slender, sleepy eyes, a generous mouth, sensuous and seducible, who did, very late at night, sometimes knock softly on my door behind which I waited, having communicated with a subtle play of eyes that the goodnight murmured was not a farewell, but an invitation to have one. They were hiding in our home, and I know this will dismay and perhaps horrify every real estate agent from coast to American coast. There were 14 of us in that house, and we had only one bathroom. <laughs> there was never enough food in my parents' house, but 14 of us had lunch, the most important meal for us anyway. 
Mostly it was rice and okra, which we planted in the ground behind the house the day the boys moved in, and which sprang into life and fertility like Jack's beanstalk, providing the something to go with that we needed for our rice. What should we make for lunch, we'd ask each other every afternoon. And each afternoon we'd give it some thought, until one of us blurted with great excitement, how about okra? <laughs> yes, we'd say, okra, and we'd high five each other. Were there people being murdered? Why, yes. But we were teenagers, reveling in our version of the French resistance, playing our small parts in the great revolution that was not coming, it was already here. We were read and called each other comrade and we quoted Marx, and so now I think it must have been 1989, because I remember the younger, less knowledgeable sister that I was, drawing one of my brothers and a few of the boys aside and asking, because oh, how I loved that dizzyingly happy high moral ground, what was about Tiananmen? and there being a lot of head shaking and consideration and soothing murmurs of someday, as in someday you will understand, which led, as these things do, to my hearing not the words but the beat of those words, you will understand, which tripped not toward understanding but to the light leap into the we shall overcome that it recalled, and which I then proceeded to sing with religious fervor as though it were the new international in the bathroom which had a door which fell far short of the ceiling so that anybody passing any of those boys but particularly particularly the boyfriend, could go up on his toes and watch me cavorting underneath the shower which had no shower head and merely fell like a forced waterfall hard on my head and on my body and I could turn my back to that door and pretend that I did not know this. Each night I unfurled a long pink carpet that my mother had purchased in the black market under the almost Singapore policies of Mrs. Bandaranaika and lay down a sheet and fluffed the three available pillows and the cushions of my mother's rudimentary living room furniture which remains to this day stiff and uncomfortable and I made a bed for the boys who lay down like sardines, each head to another's toes and spoke only in whispers. Each morning I'd help them roll up the carpet and put the bedding away and we'd leave the curtains drawn over the shut windows because we lived within 12 feet of the house next door, a mirror image, except that it was filled up with army boys. Army boys, which meant government, which meant green and the symbol of the elephant and paramilitary forces called black tigers and yellow cats and all kinds of other two-legged felines who roamed the streets and picked up boys such as ours and did not ever bring them back, ever. And each morning, my father went off to work for that government, civil servant that he was, called to duty and being dutiful, while his house filled up with boys from the village. I remember now that it was the year when my father was appointed to head the Agrarian Research and Training Institute, which came with a house for its director, a house with two stories, in other words, the house of my dreams, because only rich people lived in two-story houses, and we had never been rich. My father, a Trotskyan to this day, refused to the house, but continued to direct while we languished, and we did languish, in the bliss of being a part of dangerous times. All that is except my oldest brother, the musician, the one who swore fidelity to the sage Satya Sai Baba and all things spiritual, but also liked perfume and did his hair just so, and was therefore the butt of many jokes within the family, but particularly among us, his younger brother, these, three, these nine friends, and his only sister. He did not care for politics, did not want to participate in the revolution, did not want to think about who was dead or dying, or might be killed or jailed. He never liked Marx, did not follow in his illustrious father's socialist footsteps, and was mostly deeply disappointed by his brother's equally determined desire to repeat what he called the foolishness of that stupid man. He also acquired a British accent for words like that, stupid. Among us all, the one he loved the best was my boyfriend, also a musician whom he'd lured to some corner with his guitar while the boyfriend brought his esraj. That instrument had a special place in that bedroom, namely on the one bed, this classical curved instrument belonging to a real musician. And the two of them played very, very quietly. Remember those army boys? In the furthest part of the house, which was unfortunately the kitchen, which was a little difficult for me because the kitchen had cockroaches, the giant flying kind. And though I loved nothing more than to sit with this particular brother because it meant also sitting in the presence of the boyfriend to have an opportunity when my brother left the room to light a cigarette or use the one bathroom to stroke the boyfriend's inner arm in such a way that changed the tempo of his breathing which made me feel very womanly. I did not like the cockroaches and the cockroaches loved me. It must have been on a day after one of those frustrating kitchen music nights as I called them when the phone rang. 
Another friend calling from a town where the disappearances had been the greatest, asking for refuge, asking to speak to one of the boys, Priyantha. Priyantha, whose features only seemed to improve when I hadn't seen him in a while. The way people do, you know, you don't see someone in a while, and in your mind's eye, you intensify the good and the bad, and in this case, the ugly. It gets uglier and uglier until you finally see them again, and I'm mightily surprised by how good looking they are. That's a theory he shared with me, by the way, when I commented on it once, how good looking he looked. Priyanta, who was only second to my older brother in terms of how passionately committed he was, despite the death of two of their closest friends to the romance of the revolution, the defiance of it all, the bravado of breaking curfews and ducking into alleyways and flaunting their red-hued slogans whenever they could, because they were convinced, and they convinced me, that we would win. Priyanta picked up the phone and began to speak in explicit terms about what was going on. The word on the streets, the hope in the air, the plans afoot about whom else was in residence in my parents' house until he heard the faint clicking on the line. Did I forget to say that along with the death threats came the tapping of our phones? Even Priyanta's voice faltered as Premasuri on the other end of the line asked, did you hear that? And the silence fell between them a silence from Priyanta still holding the phone that curled and twined around everybody in the house, even those not in sight of this one boy until the whole house became unnaturally still, and for the first time we became fearful, not brave. When we talk about that moment now, we laugh. We don't speak of the way my mother took a bus to my father's office to tell him in person, alone, of what had happened. We don't speak of how my father sent his official vehicle to help his family that had never had the use of this vehicle before, driven by a man, Mullegama, who had once revealed an allegiance which matched ours in response to my question, what do you think of the JVP? The JVP being made of those whose predecessors had been tipped into mass graves during that first year I told you about, 1971, the year of the advent of the mother. We do not talk about how Mullegama arrived, the Pajero painted the color of the ruling party, and how I bid the boys a sorrowful goodbye as they each slipped quietly their few belongings in tissue paper thin bags into the Pajero, the pink and white carpet rolled and placed over their knees. There were tears, and we do not say now that the tears were for the time that we were losing, this time we'd had of hope and excitement and the charge of being a part of something massive, of having had the time of our lives, play acting change in the confines of our home, the danger all but invisible to us, because the feeling of that time together was everything, fuck the revolution. We do not talk about how it became, the way we abandoned our home and how the boy sitting in the new house my father had never wanted to accept, the rich people's house which came with furniture fit for such people, where our bottoms could find plush seats where the floors gleamed, the kitchen had an oven for baking what, and mirrored almaras in every room even though everything we owned, all 14 of us, could have fit into one. We do not talk about how we dug up a square of the ample backyard and planted okra anyway even though the chef at the canteen now walked the quarter mile from the offices to the house carrying large plates of rice and bowls of curries, how the lemons dripped off the lemon tree at the back, piling up and rotting, and how we all got sick of lemon juice we could have for free without the sugar we couldn't afford. We do not talk about how my paternal uncle hired the boys for pretend jobs, how they went to become security guards because to be in the city without a reason to be there when you were 18 and 19 and 20 and 21 was a death sentence. We do not talk about the death threats that found a new address, or the army patrols that sometimes stopped in front of the high walls of that house and stayed there for hours, watching, listening, as we watched and listened on the other side. We do not talk about the security guards at the Agrarian Research and Training Institute who patrol the premises late at night, causing the boys to quieten their voices, or how though the boyfriend now climbed the stairs at night, and though my room had a Juliet balcony complete with floor-to-ceiling drapes, though I still had my girl-only room, and though masses of printed intoxicatingly fragrant airmail packages had arrived for me from colleges in the United States with offers of full scholarships, what I felt was a lack, not a gift. What we talk about now of that day is this. How, ha, ha, Tilak, who hailed from the most rural of the villages, grabbed the phone from Priyanta and slammed it down and called him a fucking donkey. How he rushed around the house and burned all the books, including the notebooks and journals that had any mention of themselves or their beliefs. How he stammered tearfully that it was over, it was all over, we were all going to die. But most of all, we talk about my oldest brother, 
how furious he became about what was going to befall him who had no damn interest in any of this nonsense, and how in that hour when we all gathered their belongings and erased the evidence of their stay, how he paced, and how he rushed over to Satya Sai Baba's shrine, the shrine he had in his room, and stood there chanting inaudible prayers, and how he reached out to take some of the ash from the incense that gathered each night and rubbed it on the forehead of each boy, and lastly himself, and how, in the last second, something overcame him, and he grabbed a fistful of that ash and shoved it into his mouth, a sob escaping his throat. Remember that, we say, remember, remember, and we laugh. We laugh far too long and far too loud, remembering everything. So, so actually we grew up assuming that we had wealth, because so long as you had something you could give somebody else, you had. Uh, you were a haver, I guess. Uh, the flip side of this was that other people helped us. So gratitude was a central part of uh, how we grew up. Uh, from my childhood to my adulthood, I was always conscious of the fact that I accomplished things because of the grace and intervention of others uh, from um, throughout uh, my life. That's been the case. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> And, and in that light moment, I want to say, uh, Patrick, I don't know where you're sitting. Where are you sitting? Are you here? And right there. Okay. Well, it happens to be, and I'm here today, it's Patrick's birthday. And uh, he, before I get into thanking him formally, I hear that it, he doesn't care if you make a fuss about it. Um, so, and how can I resist? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Patrick. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> so, um, from, uh, from Michael Collier at the Bread Loaf Writers Conference, who has always kept a watchful eye on what I do in my life as a writer and reader, um, uh, and G Jeff Schatz at Grey Wolf Press, who um, uh, helped me with the editing of the poetry in the anthology to uh, Patrick uh, Lannan and all of the Lannanites, not all of whom I've met, who've been very gracious to me. I have been blessed in many ways to accomplish the things that I have done, uh, and I thank you greatly for that. I was listening to the VHS tapes of these recordings while I was at MAFA, and, uh, because I like the heft of VHS tapes. Um, and uh, and it's, it's not just an honor to be here, it's to, uh, to awaken to an elevated sense of purpose, to feel that whatever it is that I have said and done, uh, can be done better, and I promise will be done better. If someone can take that away, that would be great. Um, uh, so, um, I thank you for your affirmation uh, and for being the quiet force behind the advocacy that I have done and will continue to do in the future. Um, so if there were three things that you know, shaped me as a person, my family, the Buddhists, and the Catholics, there are three ge geographical locations that anchor my writing, the United States, Sri Lanka, and Palestine. Um, and uh, while I was in MAFA, I worked and finished my new novel, but I also conceptualized and worked a lot on a new project, which is a collection of poetry uh, gathered under the title, My Country, Tis. And it is the one that is most closely, deeply rooted in the American physical and emotional spaces and social justice concerns uh, that are at the bottom of all that I write and do. And I like to think of this project uh, in terms of Baldwin's uh, reference to the artist, uh, the artist's quarrel with society as being the, the quarrel of a, um, a lover, it's a lover's quarrel, where you're trying to reveal the beloved to yourself so you can reach a, a truer freedom. Uh, some of these uh, have been published, others have not. So I'll read a few of these poems for you. And this first one I wasn't going to read, but I decided to do it because there was a, a, a police shooting yesterday uh, in North Carolina, Keith Lamott Scott. Uh, so, so I felt like this would be good. I should read it, and it said, it's called Say My Name. 
In Sanford, they said it was the back of a head and then that it was a gray hooded man with candy to share. In Brooklyn, it took six more bullets after the first for Kimani, known in Africa as sweet and beautiful. 19 in Pasadena for college brought death too for Kendrick, as it did for Timothy in bed -Stuy. In Cleveland, it took 137 bullets to bring a black man and two for a boy. And who, I ask, was the caller who unleashed the dogs of the dog on a 12-year-old, their anonymity stick still. For a brother in Atlanta, it was he, not the sister he was saving, that died. And in New York City, the butchers planted 41 bullets in Amadou, 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 for the audacity of having a wallet. In that same city of sin, an altar boy went down for the affront of not having marijuana to sell to the bastards. And I ask, how many millions would his daughters return for his life? How many for Usman lying dead not far from there? No wedding for Sean Bell, 50 bullets for the guts to have a bachelor party. And friends for 11-0 pitching arm, a daughter, Jada, skills, a life, a woman waiting. This is New York, man. But we have the name of the black uniform that called fire down on a black sun. It's okay to hate him. Go ahead, do it, do it. For Orlando on his knees and the two-legged K-9s who shot him for a notch in their baby daddy takedown. In Oakland, Oscar lay face down, obliging to be killed with ease. They paid 1.2 mil to a mother for her child walking backwards, arms locked behind a head she had cradled once in time before in Portlandia, a scene of white dreams like Pensacola where Victor rode a bicycle at 17. So they rode over his body and it was a threat to the state to be black and autistic in LA, to be Stephen and hot in Denver splashing water on your face, to be strong if you're black at a zoo at the water fountain is still segregated. Didn't you know, Alonso? Didn't you know? And Ramali, weed is not for you in your grandmother's Bronx home. Not for you either, Wendell. It is for the fortunate few whose skin looks nothing like yours, their lives nothing like yours, even in your own house. What does it matter in New Orleans? A house, a bridge, Denzinger in New Orleans. James and Ronald, they said it was uncivil, but not a crime. It is never a crime when you die. Should I begin from the beginning? Should I add the women, Regina, Rekia, Chantel, Taisha, Yvette, Gabriella, Miriam, Jessica, Beauty Queen, Beautiful, Tarika, and Ayana, seven at home with your blonde Disney princesses, and Pearlie, you two to die this way at 93, and Catherine, you at 92 in your own homes. What had you done? It is always the same. No crime was committed. No crime was committed. No crime was committed. I say your names. I say your names. I say your names. This next poem uh, is about the city I'm from, and it's called Love, which, you know, Philadelphia is known for its big love statue. Love, Philadelphia. Maligned wood formed root, signed heavy in lead, centered here, passing through grown weight of trafficked feet heaved down. Burdened arch decked figurines, brown gods from Greece and Rome gild. Mortared pillars disregard homage expressed upstairs and fists. Rocky is a myth in the air between us untrue things. This American dream. Wepner stole the image of the butterfly man and black men in the right gear joined the white to take 72, ignorant of bees and sting. Six movies and creed for he that lost to the king and one for he that won. This is the story of a city of love in a country that rewrites us. Um, I have a, uh, I like to walk in cemeteries wherever I go. And when I was in Marfa, I went to the cemetery there. Before that, I had uh, heard of these two black men who had been long-term residents there. And uh, part of the community, and they were the only people, the uh, black men who had lived there. And then when they died, they were buried in this uh, cemetery, which is segregated, and uh, they were buried as paupers, and it is called, and there's a nod to Langston Hughes here, uh, it's called Grave Choice. George Livingston would have chosen as I have done, though Grannison Cheney might well have demurred to be buried alongside those whose graves were wrought in tearless silence, perhaps no less profound. 
I imagine that they may have liked, if given the chance, to choose to be lowered into the earth each as befits a man, to have some woman there to holler, cry, and moan. Brass bands would have been hard to find here then, yet even paupers they might have rested best with the wild color and noise hewn mourners on the other side. Hi. Every sky journey reaches this point where the Rockies gather and break upon the leaving green and my thoughts turn to love and sight. The cities shed as swiftly as I re-inhabit them upon my return, I turn lofty in the airy hold of flight. Swift breath of life exhaled, I can belong again to a place that has no use for me. I set my books aside, stories too, for longing lifts my eyes from word to world, and I daydream in poems, shorthand for the heart that wants only this anonymity, a descent into such loss, vast and infinite. So I've talked about Sri Lanka and I've talked a little bit about the United States, so let's go to Palestine. Uh, this, my work with us then also goes back to how I was raised in awareness of the need to be useful, to be informed, active, and engaged citizens in the world. Uh, so I talk a little bit about this in, my, um, in the preface to the anthology, uh, but my father's words in a nutshell were, you're in America, you're a writer, why aren't you doing something? Um, whether I was the right person to do it, whether this was the right time to do it, whether this would have some impact on my own life and writing and career, these questions were not germane to the fact there was an ongoing injustice and there, it was my responsibility to step forward. Um, and so I, I will read an excerpt from uh, an essay that I've written that's going to come out for uh, um, Bloomsbury Press UK is bringing out an anthology to commemorate 10 years of the Palestine Festival of Literature, which takes place under great constraints. And um, so they have some of the writers over the last 10 years who've been part of that festival um, do something for it. Um, yesterday I was wandering around on Ghost Ranch and uh, I came across this quote by Georgia O'Keeffe, nothing is less real than realism, details are confusing. It is only by selection, by elimination, by emphasis that we get at the real meaning of things. So, uh, so this, it kind of, I felt like it connected to the essay that I'm going to read. It is a hybrid part prose poem, past travelogue, so shut your eyes if you must and follow along on this journey with me. It's called Sight. It takes seven hours to cross a few hundred yards into occupied Palestine. We are the last ones left in the empty waiting room, tiled so smooth it turns my mind to dance. Someone finds music on his iPhone and I stand up, defying the odds. In Ramallah, we sit under a slivered new moon, a venue so open it holds everybody and no late arrival disturbs. Our readers speak of Guantanamo and Palestine. A child peers down over a high wall, holding his father's safekeeping hand, listening. There is an American edge to the bar we set in late. Arak, licorice, slightly sweet, intoxication growing within, undetected like the place itself. Fever plays on the sound system. A Palestinian friend says, Ramallah has three bars, but we Bethlehemites can pretend we aren't occupied. Enigma. Bethlehem has broken into pieces like candied brittle. We have learned to navigate shards. Time is made of elasticity and imagination. Will I ever forget dancing to rock around the clock in the waiting room of the Allen B. Bridge crossing, risking everything for an act of defiance? that instead of speaking of hunger and fear, we spoke of how my 70-year-old partner did not want to dance without proper heels in front of the handsome older man in our group. Oh, Palestine, how quickly we learned to wrest joy out of denial. How swift this transformation from riotous indignation to acknowledging the euphoria of the allowable moment. In Kalandia, between steel bars funneled like consumer products off to the next destination for packaging and barcodes, we suppress everything except our laughter at the discombobulated voice floating down from the manacled watchtower. No pictures. We saw one picture. I hand out mints on the other side and celebrate us, we who have taken more than 200 pictures in that crossing. Inside the church of the Holy Sepulchre, we place palms over the stone where Jesus is said to have been embalmed. 
Around us, doors, crosses, and extravagance of windows above beckoning stone paths. At night, the streets fall silent. An eerie luster pervades this sacred place. The pink and yellow walls rise up, containing. In the old city of Al Khalil, Hebron, new plaques on renamed streets announce fictions that permit desecration. Checkpoints are as ordinary as traffic lights. Trash is thrown on your head as you walk down romantic cobbled streets that in any European town would be where bright cafes spring up. Safe passage requires quiescence, so you take pictures of vine leaves in bunches, pickled vegetables, children jostling to see themselves on your camera, the curved road of shuttered shops with their pretty green and blue doors now sealed with chains, wrought iron balconies in disrepair, four American teenagers on a birthright trip, sipping coke and laughing on the porch that once belonged to a Palestinian, while soldiers petrol and settlers with machine guns drive too fast or pace the silent roads. The call to prayer rises over the heads of soldiers in barricades, cuts through checkpoints, fills every trench and barrel, slips through the bars of rusty gates and coils of barbed wire that are supposed to block and exclude, wraps around the rubble and ruins of pale pink rock, collects each shard of glass in its embrace. You think of God. Everywhere, the 25-foot-high wall stretches, hooded in sharp angles over roads, bridges, tunnels. I imagine setting fire at one end. Like an incendiary Andy Goldsworthy installation of land art, I want to watch its 650 kilometers implode in orderly flames. The left ash would settle into the earth, releasing us to grieve. The stage in Haifa is set up like an open-air political podium, bare and stuck, a rostrum and mic, beyond it an amphitheater. A young woman sings ballads in Arabic which are always about love, longing, home and freedom. I listen in translation. The stabs of daggers are better than the rule of the treacherous. There is a comic madness to the term present absentee coined to define Palestinians who live in what is called Israel, but not in their original homes which have been confiscated. Palestinians return the favor. They pretend not to see the settlers and soldiers, denying the oppressor his validity. There are ghosts who walk among ghosts here, and we are visitors wading through the thicknesses of fiercely held history, like this. The Hilton Hotel rises above Palestinian graves in the Abd al-Nabi Cemetery in Jaffa and the Wadi Hunayan Mosque in Ramleh is now a synagogue. Israel's Museum of Tolerance is being built over Palestine's Mamilla Cemetery. Those claiming there were no people on a barren land preserve the home of the Abu Khalil family in Sheikh Mouanis. It is the clubhouse now for the faculty of Tel Aviv University. The mountains en route to Nablus are deformed by settlements that fall and fall and fall into verdant valleys. Palestinians exist in the crevices left to them, and yet around the most basic shelters, flowers and plants are cultivated, color wrested from thin air. At the souk in the old city, we buy za'ata, star anise, saffron, olive soap. In a thin perfumery, I stop. The owner and I smell senses and talk of books, life, his young child. His private collection of bottles, tiny and expensive, he refuses to sell. But before I leave, he applies a dot of his favorite, a white mask on my wrist. It lasts all day and through the night. Every shop is like this, a portal into a world where nothing hostile awaits. Every turn relieves slopes climbing into other realms in these intimate senses of town that recall communal life. Cars creep down stairways built shallow, resilient enough to carry more than they were meant to. A man gives me a coffier for my father. He makes me photograph his name and address. Remember me, he says. Birds interrupt the first reader at our evening program, and at one point we stop for the adhan. Around us, fat felines wander, but on the way back through streets so feet with secrets, I see a skinny cat leaping over a high roof, sure-footed against the skies. In Nablus, the wheels of cars break the quiet, as though they are fleeing, tires squealing. Late, I look for cardboard to protect the maps I've been carrying on and off our bus, visual proof of a brutal occupation whose specificities may escape my memory and voice. AJ, the hostel receptionist, finds construction paper, twine. Outside, gunshots. He translates the rhythms, a family member returned from jail, or a family mourning the dead. On Facebook, a friend request from a boy in Gaza, welcome to my country, you will be changed forever. 
Palestine is desiccated by settlements. The first outpost is the orange mobile tower on a hillside. Mobile homes follow, often spaced across some distance. The government deems that roads are necessary to connect these homes, then that the roads must be protected from Palestinians. In these incremental ways, land is annexed. The word settlement evokes temporariness. The permanence of these structures devastate. The Catholic University in Bethlehem observes the call to prayer on Friday in its gardens memorials to students killed by the Israelis. At a falafel joint in Bethlehem, I talk with students who travel from Deshe refugee camp. Our conversation is easy, clothes, boyfriends, families, what led each to choose to wear the hijab, their preferred breakfast, hummus made by their mothers, their future, the possibility of attending Bard University in Jerusalem, how to take a better selfie. Later, a taxi driver defies the law and races us to the church of the newly canonized nun, the first Palestinian at the Carmelite convent. We are six perched on laps, sometimes breaking into hysterical laughter along with the driver, a giddiness born of getting away with bad behavior, other times solemn as we pass memorial after memorial to the war dead. The Church of the Nativity, being renovated by the Palestinian Authority, contains the spot where Jesus is said to have been born. I kneel and pray for the believers in my life. The graffiti on the apartheid wall near Aida refugee camp exemplifies the Palestinian concept of Samud, Steadfastness, perseverance. One says, Ferguson, Palestine. A half back bend is required to see the top. The beauty of the movement juxtaposes with the unassailable atrocity of the wall. Its existence stains the life and spirit I celebrate in dance. I weep. From the roof of the Al Rawad Cultural Center, we see the wall jag around three sides of a single home that has resisted demolition, imprisoning it in a sharp U that reminds me of Hebrew script. Inside the center, a 19-year-old boy dances like his very life could take flight. A 14-year-old girl sings the anthem, Mautini. Will I see you in your eminence, reaching to the stars, my homeland, my homeland? Her voice around the Arabic is suffused with longing. The Al-Aqsa Mosque stands in the most disfigured and militarized holy ground in the world, the approach barred by a checkpoint barbellate with ordnance. To reach the mosque, Palestinians must first pass settlers coming to celebrate mitzvahs amid raucous singing and drums, the guards joining them in dance, guns and fists in the air. After that, more security and through a long caged tunnel lined with riot gear, there is no escape. Inside, a Palestinian women take turns to sit in a circle and read audibly from the Quran. A group of settlers comes threateningly close and the women raise their voices in warning to the Palestinian guards. God is great. It is beautiful here. Pale walls built in time long past, the skill apparent in the details, the sheer scale. It is hard not to compare monument to monstrosity, that other wall that grinds itself into the earth. A Palestinian man sweeps the long narrow flows of the checkpoint. The climb through Ramallah's hills leads through furrowed fields grooved like the outside of walnuts. The olive trees are small, the spacing between each enough to allow travel, the leaves silvery in the light. Along each path, nettles punch and farrow the blood of Jesus, a dark pink flower that is the last to die, thyme, sage, other herbs. We climb on unsteady rocks all the way to a casa used by the farmers during the harvests, made of the creamy pitch rock that I associate with this country. Stairs ascend to the open roof from the cool interior with its uneven floor. I imagined weathered men and women working here, their children running wild, unwatched for a day. The light falls yellow gold as we leave, gilding the thin grasses. There is a chill in the air and we shiver as we sit in the gardens of the Sakakani Cultural Center in Ramallah. The last reading begins with lines from Darwish. At dinner, I walk a bartender through making me a drink I've come to know. Rum enfolded in sambuca and yellow chatrus. They call it Palestine Libra. Um, so I will close uh, with a few more poems. Uh, we have a word in Singhala called murdu. Murdu directly translated would mean soft, but it's more like a, a mix between tenderness and compassion. Uh, and um, 
I, I, I thought that maybe I will end with some of that tenderness, also poems from that same, uh, and the same collection. Uh, they're all somehow about home and heritage. Um, you know, Ralph Ellison said that we discover our humanity by continuing to place, pay, play in the face of certain defeat. And I return often to that quote when the odds seem stacked. But I am an optimist at heart, all appearances to the contrary. <laughs> uh, but uh, I believe that if you redefine victory uh, to draw the larger circle, that defeat is not inevitable. So uh, and that's kind of how I go through things. As these poems are. Well, uh, I'll read three of them, and they have to do with uh, home and heritage in one way or another. The first of these is called Escargo. Curl is what I think, brown, full of life, ended where I begin with silent tongue to taste five, a perfect uneven on plate set by the curator of art moonlighting here, a companion of magnitude across with steak and opinions, tequila soaked but clarion in word choice and thought, I don't think wormed earth and slime silvered drains the clinging places that host the slow moving innocence and how now they rest at last butter soaked drunk. The music of the blessed draw close around. We lean in to gossip of others, of us, old friends already newly met. And this is why I choose a dish I liked to French around my mouth not try, not for real like this, with mad joy at everything new, this town, this dark like me seeker, mother, woman, love, alive before me, this bar, this food, the wild miracle of it. And when we leave, lingering for talk, the way it is in this place where goodbyes are hardly ever meant, I forget those shells, yet barely have to ask another for his. It is given palm to careful palm, a souvenir, this fragile, empty bone that whispers home. Um, this next one uh, is called Remembrance, and it came from me picking up some puppies that somebody had thrown away because I wanted to do something else with them. Um, remembrance. Neither lush nor scant, these flowers in red, orange, my adult colors, used first for bravery, then to disguise hurt, and joy in equal measure they came to me, owed to what lies curled at the center, the purple hint of royalty and pain visible in their hearts too. Here, I said, sending a photograph, nothing is wrong, I add. I go on, habituated, save all that is beautiful, anything that speaks still of use. I picked these up, discarded flowers, a wish to make of them something other than waste, compost a return. Poppies, he said, the flower of remembrance, what color held in your palm? Not forgotten after all, I gaze at them anew and remember. Days when I walked white uniform, my business card, pausing by strangers to ask on their behalf, soldiers now unvoiced from weapon and self. 25 cents to perforate my pinprick card, a red paper poppy their gift. Remember also how hard it was to fill a single one, and how when my friends came back to school, tidy bundles rubber banded, money to spare, I added mine. I cannot recall even then, shame of having not done enough. I did all I could. Um, this last one uh, is for someone I met in Marfa and, uh, who has, and who is familiar to the Lennon audiences as well. Um, it's Ali Abunima. And uh, I, th I was talking with Martha earlier this afternoon and I thought, well, this would be a good, good poem to close with, uh, tying all of this stuff together uh, on you know, where we come from and what we end up doing, where we find ourselves. For Ali. 
We too are brown, like leather and molasses. We speak of and for our people and mean it. We say, white people are not like us. We pick white people to love us anyway. We chase frugality and fail, cook too much food, and we worry it is never enough. We invite everybody, assured we can feed the town. We claim our grains multiply, our homes expand. We want them all fed, sated, bedded in corners, or we want them to take whatever is left. Our tongues spill this other language, our poetry and verse set like our plates, our rhythms gathered from far travels, our couplets arranged in rhymes that unravel our efforts, our best but never adequate, our concerns here but never entirely, our hearts beating, beating to drums that sound our faraway earth, the love left there. We walk, he and I, among the graveyards of this place and call out the lives we imagine must have come before. Look, I say, he died young in war in a foreign place. Look, he says, she died of a broken heart. How is it that we walk among the dead and do not think of our own mortality? We ask each other this, fall silent for a while. I think of the people who might leave me, he says, my parents. I think of the people to whom I will leave grief, I say, my daughters. I never think of me, he says. I never think of me, I say. We never think of us and this lit world where his country and mine are one. Thank you.